I've, I've seen you know YouTube videos of guy play, guys playing Beatles songs that the chords are all wrong. They're yeah. just all wrong, you know. And I see it all the time. People misinterpret Beatles songs, and it drives me crazy. And I do it too, actually. I've done it too because I. I used to gather Beatles songs out of my mind rather than listening to the record and oh. figuring it out. So often I'd make mistakes. That's why this is a fun process. Has this, this been a revelation to yeah. you? Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. There were things that you never played quite correctly, that sort of thing? Yeah, and things I haven't really sat down and really figured out. Yeah. Like that's happening with Glass Onion. That's, uh, you know, I never really worked on that too. So um, this song I've played ever since I heard the White Album. I, I, I've always known how to play this song. Um, now, what are there other uh, there are other things to wrap up on this tune? Yeah, I'm trying to think here. Um, um, oh, I wanted to mention this real quick. Last, this is a good segue to last week's lecture when I talked about the Mixolydian scale. If you do it without the blues convention of the minor third to the third, it sounds just very white. But no blues in that. But if I go... All of a sudden, you hear the blues. Because there's this little convention of sliding from the minor third to the third. Oh, I see. And this is what I mean. There's, that's as much theory as I can give you about it. You know? In other words, like, all right, well, to get a bluesy sound, you take the minor third of a chord and then resolve it to its major third. But the fact of the matter is it's something you feel. You, you feel how to do it. Right. Uh, and that's what makes the blues remarkable. Is this, that why some of these, uh, the great blues players that probably can't read a note of music, but uh, right, right. play like banshees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have from the Beatles uh, recording sessions book, uh, the tensions within the Beatles came to a head during the session and Ringo Starr quit the group. Um, Everyone privy to the sad state of affairs was sworn secrecy and the news didn't reach the press. And in fact, they, they booted their engineers and everybody out of the room when they were pissed off and needed to talk. Oh. Which was a smart move on their part because it, it Nothing kept leaked. the rumors down about their, their impending Demise, breakup. right. But the cute, the cute part of this story is that, this is kind of funny too because I just had a, a problem with the, me and the uh, drummer of my jam band just recently locked horns and it mm -hmm. left us with a bad feeling because we've been friends for years and never had a fight and we had a fight we had an out out now big ass argument and uh this so reminds me of the same thing because you know one day he texted me a couple of weeks later and said Vinny you're a genius man I'm sorry I was really grumpy and, <laughs> and it's back to you know loving flowers again in fact we hugged uh, when we saw each other and his girlfriend said are you guys gay <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, well you know, that's well, our secret. we're musicians. <laughs> yeah, right. We're musicians, so we've got to be. Um, all right. Uh, so anyway, what had happened was the Beatles were, you know, Ringo seemed really serious about this. Mm. And the reason why he quit was, like, there, there'd be, like, sessions where he'd work for nine hours straight, just work his ass off. Or, conversely, he'd be, you know... Show up for a session that's supposed to be, everybody's supposed to be there at 9 a.m. And nobody friggin' shows for like three hours or something. Oh. So he was starting to get pissed. Obviously, he was, he had a lot of integrity to uh, getting things done. And, you know, actually, I would say second to Paul, Paul who had all this vibrancy and enthusiasm mm -hmm. about keeping the, the Beatles rolling. Ringo was the second man in position oh, for that's that. that's a surprising anecdote then. Yeah. And they missed him so much that uh, they... Uh, they decorated the studio with flowers when he came back and, and uh, hung up a sign that said, Welcome back, Ringo, when they, they huh. made amends. It was, it was really kind of sweet. Huh. And he really, really appreciated that. Like, he felt during this period unloved by the rest of the okay. Beatles, like unappreciated, pretty much. Um, Did he ever take to heart, I, I mean, I know along the way there were critics and stuff that would sort of put down his drumming. It's like, you know, he's the least talented of the four Beatles and all that sort of thing. Did yeah, that well, it's that old <laughs> adage of, you know, what do you call a drummer? Somebody who hangs out with musicians. Oh, you know, right? Yes, right. <laughs> but but did, did that ever bother him? That I mean, there was... I that, don't know. It would come up now and again. Well, or was he, he was, smiling you know, all the way to the bank? I mean, I think, uh, you know, they largely ignored the critics after a while. I, I think, uh, you know, when you're in a position like that, if you let yourself get annoyed and bothered by critics, you're, you're really in trouble. Yeah. You know? Sting wrote a song off uh, Ten Summoner's Tales, awesome song called St. Augustine in Hell. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. That, this record is like 
a yeah. sleeper. Nobody knows about this. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, St. Augustine in Hell is the story of St. Augustine given, given into temptation and, you know, he has this great desire for this woman, so he winds up in hell because he's, you know, he's given into his temptation. So uh, it's really cool because in, in at the, the section, the musical section where St. Augustine is actually in hell, we hear uh, Kenny Kirkland playing uh, like whole tone scales and just this weird kind of, kind of hell-esque mm -hmm. music, you know. And uh, there's this voiceover that Sting does, he's the devil, welcome, welcoming St. Augustine there. And he says to St. Augustine, you're, you're going to love it here. You're going to have lots of friends, you know. We have, we have ex-popes and politicians and music critics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sting is my number two guy. The Beatles are number one. Sting is number two for me. Interesting guy. I'm sad that we give a little salute to Kenny Kirkland. Yeah, uh, sad that he's gone. gone. And the guys that Sting surrounded himself with what I would call true jazz musicians. Oh, sure. All right. What I call a not true jazz musician is a jazz purist, the guy who's only capable of playing Bach. Oh. You know. Uh, but these were jazzers that understood rock and reggae and, you know, mm. blues and, and, you know, I mean, that's a real musician, somebody who understands. There's pa It has to do with pattern recognition. Country music or, or, or blues music, whatever, they both employ the pentatonic scale as it's its usual device. You just change the technique up a little bit and you got a country sound. Yeah. So I always wondered why musicians would call them say, oh, I'm a country musician or I'm a jazz musician. I'm a, I'm a musician, man. I, yeah. I, I can sit inside most pockets. You know, I just love it all. Well, it's that know. old uh, Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington. You know, good music's good music. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. The genre doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it really doesn't, you know. So... That's back in the so, USSR. Let's see. Is there a, any again. weird thing about the end or anything like that? Oh well, you know, I was just gonna mention. I'd like to bring up the Beach Boys. Right there. Yeah. Is this chorus? This is the bridge. Yeah. The bridge. And, and, uh, all this stuff, this is all like California rock, and especially uh, Beach Boys. Um, this is where, like, you hear some on Peppers, you hear some of the Beach Boys influence on Peppers. By the time we get to Abbey Road, it is all over the map. Yeah. I mean, Abbey Road is pretty much McCartney's record. Huh. It pretty much is, and it's a work of brilliance. It's a work of pure brilliance. Uh, so at the ending... Nothing much to speak of, but it, uh, one thing I will say is uh, during the Pepper period, they also did on the White Album, there are a couple of songs on Pepper that flowed right into each other, like one, the volume would be low while one is fading, the other one comes up and you start mm -hmm. a new song. Like, yeah. The whole, actually, the first three songs of Peppers do that. Okay. You know, we get... Uh, we get the introduction to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Cup Band and Flip Billy Shoot. Do, 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 do. Right. What would you do? Right? Um, with a little help. And then at the ending, with a little help from my friend. You know, back into, right into Lucy in the Sky. So they were experimenting. And mm -hmm. bear in mind, at the time, this was this was kind of. I won't say radical, but it was something that hadn't been done before in the music industry. There was actually literally a, a, a standard. Like between songs, you had to have this much amount oh. of time on the, on the record before the next song, that right. sort of thing. And they broke that standard, of course. Huh. 